So first we have Siobhan Senior, who will be talking about indigenous print and digital legacies. And then we have Chris Phillips, who will be talking about the Easton Library Company Loan Records Project. And then we have the duo of Jim Egan and Jean Bauer, who will be talking about mapping colonial America's publishing. And finally, we have uh, David Rawson speaking on building an index of Virginia printing. So, Chauvin. Sorry, I'm having connection problems in all of my little devices. Okay, um, I just wanted to open a conversation today about um, literary anthologies um, and how new media, in conversation with uh, much older indigenous ways of curating literary histories, might change the very idea of an anthology. When we do these digital projects, we tend to talk about archives. Um, all that time and use that term very uh, capaciously, but I, I want to think just a little bit about the term anthology and what's at stake when an anthology tries to embrace what Dan Cohen calls the successful genres of the web, um, including blogs, wikis, and social media. Um, a lot of us use anthologies in our classes, willingly or unwillingly, and some of us make them as editors. Um, I just finished this one that's coming out next year with the University of Nebraska Press, Don Land Voices, an anthology of writing from indigenous New England. Um, my field is Native American lit. Um, the book is 600 pages in manuscript, and so I'm working now on extending it online. Um, I have started it in Omeka. Uh, I'm open to other platforms, including Mukadu, which I'll talk about a little bit at the end. Um, for reasons I'll explain, I want this anthology to be open to tribal contributions and input, but I'm also finding some obstacles to community uptake of these platforms, which is what I want to pick your brain about. Um, at the end of this talk. So first, why do an anthology online? Um, of course, it's a question of access, like a lot of us have in mind. But for me, it's also a question of literary value. Um, sorry. Um, this, I just got my latest issue of Studies in American Indian Literatures in the mail the other day. And they had this sort of a standard uh, call that I'm sure is familiar to a lot of people in this room, to literary historians. Um, for me, putting this online is a question of finding out what kinds of literature gets valued within tribal communities, which is sometimes not the same kinds of literature that gets valued um, by English professors or by um, professional archives. So I had these kinds of goals of recovery in mind when I started the print anthology. Um, but I also ran up against the limits of my own training as a literary scholar. And here's what happened. I would get all excited when I would discover, and I'm using that term advisedly, when I would discover uh, an unknown Native American poet, uh, for example, the infamous Carlisle Indian School, which some of you may have heard of, uh, was in Pennsylvania. And it was not generally known for having a lot of Native students from New England there. Um, but I found their school papers were publishing a guy named Alfred DeGrasse, who was a Wampanoag Mashpee Indian from Cape Cod. So I would copy these poems and rush down to Cape Cod and talk to Wampanoag elders about him, and they would say, oh, him. <laughs> <laughs> and then they would say, but have you ever heard of Mabel Levant? Right? Mabel Levant was also writing poems in the early 20th century. Um, and we still recite her poems at community events, even though, as far as I can tell, Mabel Levant was never published outside of Mashpee. Her poems would get published at little tribal um, event flyers, and then they would get recirculated um, in books like this one, Mashpee, uh, Land of the Wampanoags, which was published in 1970 by a tribal member named Amelia Bingham. Um, and it's out of print now, but everybody at Mashpee has their own well-thumbed copy of this book. So. Um, the ways that tribal communities were cherishing and stewarding their own tribal literary histories really challenged the way I had been trained to think about literary history. Um, I do consider myself a card-carrying canon buster. You know, I went to grad school in the 90s where everybody was talking about canonicity and marginalized traditions and literary recovery. Um, but I now think that whatever good we can do, um, by rooting around in the archives, and I do believe that we can do good by rooting around in the archives. Um, there's really no way to see some of this literary history without seeding some of our um, usual editorial anthologizing control. Um, it's tribal communities that really know who their writers are, and they're the ones who have stewarded their literary traditions, sometimes through oral traditions, as in the case of Mabel Levant, and uh, sometimes by bootlegging. There was um, this book that some of you may have seen, 
Um, it was a nice moment when Annette Kolodny republished this book from 1893, Joseph Nicolor's Life and Traditions of the Red Man, said to be the first Penobscot book. Um, but Annette did not discover <laughs> this book, actually. In the 80s, I was up at Indian Island, and they were selling a mimeographed copy at a gas station for 10 bucks of this book. And um, it was being passed around among Penobscot people and argued about um, among po uh, Penobscot people well before Duke University Press ever got its paws on it. So um, there is a trend now in digital archiving known as digital repatriation. Um, and there are beautiful, beautiful projects going on at big archives like the American Philosophical Society in Yale where they're creating what they call electronic surrogates. Um, of materials that are native materials that have found their way one way or another into collections like the APS um, and making them re-accessible to native communities, sometimes in really good consultation um, with native elders and tribal historians like they're doing at Yale. Um, still, these are colonial archives, not tribal archives, and as such they hold very different material than what you might find, say, in an elder's garage. <laughs> where she's been stuffing filing cabinets for her whole lifetime of newspaper clippings and letters, um, or on a tribal historic preservation officer's Facebook page, where he's eliciting um, input about historic photos from tribal members, um, or even tribal community offices, which have been retaining, without any funding help from any age or anywhere, have been uh, retaining incredible troves of things like tribal community newsletters that have been publishing native poets. Um, now, uh, in in library parlance, they are undiscoverable, right, because these things haven't been cataloged anywhere. So when I compiled Don Land Voices, I wanted to cede uh, editorial control as much as possible, not because I am so generous and anti-colonial, even though I want to be generous and anti-colonial, but because I simply do not know um, who the most revered writers are in any number of a dozen tribal communities from Maine um, and the Maritimes down to Connecticut. Um, so I worked with a dozen tribal editors asking them to decide which text best represented their communities and they came up with much more material than we could ever put even in an unwieldy 600 page book. So the move to online sp space seemed very logical and very reasonable, that it could be infinitely extensible. Um, additionally, tribal editors were frequently, not always, but frequently shy about exercising editorial authority, frequently shy about making choices about what texts were going to go in and what texts were going to get cut out, about annotating texts and therefore speaking for them. Um, in theory, digital space would allow us to add material, remove material, um, annotate material, and even open up intra-tribal disagreements about material. I will tell you that that Joseph Nicoler book is argued about much more contentiously among Penobscot people than you would ever know mm -hmm. from Duke University Press's scholarly edition. Um, in print, this is not the way I think anthologies are generally imagined as quite so flexible or extensible or even inchoate. Um, Karen Kilcup, who's done her share of anthology editing, says that no matter what you try to do as an editor, no matter how modest or humble you try to be in saying this is not the authoritative edition, when you put it out in an anthology, you are still creating a mini canon. Um, anthology says best that has been thought and said. Um, so I'm trying to find ways to chafe against that process while still sort of figuring out what to call this thing. Um, I have started with Omeka. Um, I know a lot of you here have used Omeka to really good uh, advantage, and I admire this. Um, I admire the kinds of sites it can produce, like the, the ones you guys are doing at Northeastern now, the R, R Marathon Archive, um, where really anybody who's got a story to tell can contribute. That's the theory, right? Contribute to this um, database. Um, so in my fantasy world, I would give each one of the 12 tribal editors her own Omeka account and she would start uploading materials independently and curating them with rich metadata and voila. Um, but you know the project is still nascent but that hasn't happened. Um, and to my knowledge community uptake has been relatively slow or sporadic with other indigenous digital projects um, including mine. Um, and I would love to hear from anyone in here, uh, even on non-indigenous crowdsourced um, projects, how you, how you get public participation and how you sustain it and how you evoke it. So I have three ideas um, about what's going on here, why it hasn't um, picked up community engagement so much. I think only part of it is actually about 
um, tribal protectiveness and privacy. This is a platform called Mukadu, and every time I talk about my archive, somebody says, don't you know about Mukadu? And I do know about Mukadu. I spent a week learning Mukadu at DHSI last summer. And um, Mukadu is brilliant because it creates a system of culturally sensitive, flexible protocols that would allow tribes to control, say, who can see certain materials. Certain materials should not be visible to non-tribal members. Maybe certain vi materials should be visible only to members of a particular family or only to women. Um, it's wonderful. Unfortunately, Muku Mukadu is less user-friendly than Omeka and, and really not ready. Um, if you want a Mukadu instance, you have to uh, go through their team and. I've been on a waiting list for over six months. So um, they're, they're very small and oversubscribed. They're, they're coming, but they're, they're not quite ready yet. Um, a somewhat bigger issue is web literacy. I, I brought a bunch of tribal elders to a digital lab about a month ago, um, and it was hilarious just trying to get people signed up for accounts. And it was hilarious and not actually different, I will say, than getting a bunch of undergraduates signed up for account, digital native mythologies aside, right, they just don't have some of this basic web literacy. So some people got into their email and accepted the invitation very readily. Some people mistyped their own username. Some people forgot their glasses. Um, so, you know, there's obviously a basic training learning curve that has to hap here, happen here. But the, the final, and for me, the, the biggest concern and issue is that of time and resources, particularly of compensation for tribal elders. Um, NEH and other foundations have have done a great support for the building of tools like Omeka and Mukadu. Um, there's been less support that I'm aware of for actually enabling people to use these tools and encouraging them to use these tools. Um, that might be outside the mission of NEH and other funding agencies, but um, they're definitely something to think about um, because when I've applied for grants, um, grants of $500 or $1,000 or even a $3,000 stipend is just not going to cut it. Um, for, an, for an underemployed tribal elder. Um, so just to wrap up, the single most successful exhibit we did on this site was actually a multi-pronged partnership with um, the Mount Kearsarge Indian Museum up in Warner, New Hampshire, and a number of historical societies and my students working on an exhibit about Abenaki baskets. Actually, we were making the case that baskets should be considered as a form of literacy. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to talk about that later. Um, or other exhibits on the website, but I've been talking about them a lot lately in other forums. And mainly the two things I wanted to get your expertise and thoughts on today were A, this notion of digital anthologies distributed among everyday readers, and if that represents any real changes to the way we think about canonicity. Um, and B, this other issue of fostering and sustainity, sustaining community uptake of platforms like Omeka. So I had a lot of coffee that was probably even faster than 15 minutes, but I'm done. <laughs> Um, I guess I'll, I'll start, um, maybe as a way of killing time, marking time, whatever you want to say, uh, with a, a materiality story that I was, uh, in honor of the theme of the conference, I'm Chris Phillips, by the way, from Lafayette College, I'm an early Americanist who's been kind of drifting into digital studies through one means or another. Uh, I specialize in historical poetics, uh, tend to have very traditional archival methods to go with these things I'm trying to figure out. I was going to bring in media that was at least new to me, so I was going to uh, live tweet this lecture uh, after a fashion using uh, an app that's been developed by a team at Purdue called Backdraft. And uh, as I was uh, heading to the bus station, my wife was driving, we both realized that my iPad was sitting on my nightstand. And because it's such a small kind of home-built app, it doesn't work on anything but an iPad. So instead of that, I have uh, managed to generate just one tweet, which I'm hoping I can send right now, which will have a lot of the goodies that those other tweets were supposed to have. So you'll be able to follow up on some of the things that I'm going to talk about uh, way too quickly in this talk. All right. So thanks, Jean, for getting this materiality to work. So hopefully we'll, we'll uh, keep this going. Uh, we've got vocal media, we've got the classic media now of PowerPoint, uh, we've got script media, so I think we're all ready to go. Uh, what I'm talking about here is a project I kind of stumbled into. Again, my specialty is poetry, uh, but I teach 
in uh, Easton, Pennsylvania, a little town in the uh, Lehigh Valley. Uh, it's also the county seat of Northampton County. This is right on the New Jersey border, about 60 miles north of Philadelphia. One of the three places, by the way, where the Declaration of Independence was first read in public. It was simultaneously read, whatever we mean by that term, uh, July 8th, 1776, in Philadelphia, Trenton, and Easton. Um, so they still do a reenactment every year. Uh, the big Philadelphia connection I'm going to talk about today has to do with uh, the first public library in this area, which was modeled on the LCP. And it has uh, an indirect but really kind of intriguing connection to that that I'll talk about in just a moment. Um, I found out about this collection from a historian, Liam Reardon, who's at the University of Maine. Uh, he did his dissertation on uh, micro histories of Delaware Valley cities during the Revolution and spent a lot of time in Easton, probably more time than any historian has in quite a while. And uh, he told me when he came into town to give a talk and we were uh, uh, chatting afterwards that there's this huge cache of library records and nobody's ever done anything with them. But you would have to live in Easton to be able to work with these. So we start with the local here before we move to the digital. Or maybe you, we can only get the digital via the local here. Um, just for those of you watching at home, here's what I just sent out on Twitter. There's this uh, password protected link on my uh, website where you can uh, access slides that Eric Lurz, one of my main collaborators, has put together. He's the, the main force behind designing the database that I'm going to be talking about. He's a digital librarian at the college. Uh, he put together a series of slides showing wireframes of what our interface will look like. That's not quite there yet. Uh, the logical data model. Uh, some sample visualizations. I'm going to fly through a few of those slides, but if you want to look at more leisure, you can look at that. There's also a scan of the only printed catalog the ELC ever produced uh, from 1855 that will give you a sense of what kinds of things are in the collection at that point. So if you go to that site, you can uh, find out about those things. So I want to start the history of the library with a man who died some uh, 55 years before it was founded, William Parsons. <coughs> who's considered the father of Easton. Uh, he was a, a surveyor who laid out the city in 1752, part of the uh, Penn family's entourage of agents who were uh, scouring the colony, trying to figure out how to develop it. And he saw this uh, site where the Delaware and the Lehigh Rivers come together, and he thought, wow, this would make a great trading post. So that's where Easton uh, comes into play. He uh, sold a lot of the original plots. Uh, my first address in town was on Parsons Street, uh, and uh, he's buried in uh, you know, somewhat tucked away fashion, but if you can find it, it looks fairly grand by colonial Easton uh, burial standards. Uh, the uh, interesting indirect connection here is that he was part of Franklin's Junto in Philadelphia when he was a shoemaker uh, before getting mixed up with the Penn family and all that. And uh, he was the second librarian of the Library Company of Philadelphia. Yeah, he dies long before anybody in Easton gets the idea we should have one of those. Um, but it's almost as if this was inevitable, particularly because the current public library building that holds these records is on what then was known as Mount Jefferson. It's now called Library Hill on Fifth Street. And uh, this is uh, the Carnegie building that once the ELC had died, it was absorbed by the uh, local high school, then became a public uh, library right around 1900. One of the first things they did was to hit up Andrew Carnegie for the library money that he was uh, sending around the country. And uh, this was cited on uh, the burying ground for St. John's Lutheran Church, one of the main burying grounds of Easton in the early days uh, where Parsons was buried. And in fact, that image of where <coughs> he's late, he is right here. Everybody passes him on the stairs up to the main entrance of the library, but there's a big retaining wall, and unless you actually step onto the lawn, you can't see that Parsons is buried there. So he's kind of the, the ghost as you uh, go into the building right between the Carnegie part and the more modern uh, extension in the 1950s. So maybe it's inevitable that Easton wound up with an LCP modeled shareholding library, but in any case, in 1811, uh, it winds up with a shareholding library starting out with 100 shares, $4 a share. Uh, they uh, almost immediately sell. And uh, it opens in 1811, the year that these uh, shares are first circulated uh, with an original collection of somewhere around 150, 200 volumes. About half are bought, half are donated by members, especially board members. 
And the early ledger uh, pages look something like this. This is one from uh, probably the, the most uh, famous member of the ELC at this point in history, George Wolfe, who's the only uh, Estonian to become governor of Pennsylvania. He's the guy who sets up the uh, public school system statewide, in fact. Uh, and uh, he's also uh, noted in uh, some very brief histories that have been written of the, the local library uh, as having a slip of paper which survives in a Ziploc bag in the collection uh, today with a whole bunch of similar slips, uh, proxy slips that shareholders had to allow people to check things out. Usually they would have a name on them, but George Wolfe had one that said, uh, let the bearer of this uh, check out books on my account. So this may very well have been part of how he built up his political capital in Easton was by letting people use his library account. Um, up through the 1830s, this is a 50-year uh, data set. Right now, we've been able to transcribe about the first 15 years of that. So we're up to about 1825. Um, Wolf is an original member of this. We have his record starting in 1811. And uh, up through the 1830s, one thing we have in the ledgers is this column, which shows who's signing the book out. These are arranged by shares, so you get on a two-page spread. Everything is connected to this particular shareholder. Uh, you see he has one share, so that way the librarian knows how many uh, books he can take out at one time. You get the, the book title, uh, sometimes with the author, the uh, shelf number, uh, when it's due, uh, or uh, when it's taken out, when it's due, when it's returned, anything about how it's returned. And here we get names like uh, Mary Wolf, um, uh, to his son, uh, by Miss Sarah. Uh, and so one of the things we're trying to do right now is figure out who all these people are. Uh, we get all kinds of different references uh, per order to his lady, um, uh, servant boy, servant girl. Uh, a couple of them in the 1820s uh, very tantalizingly uh, are entered black boy, black girl. And so we're trying to figure out what's going on with those families. Why uh, is it a black boy or black girl being sent? And why is that being recorded in the library? It's one of the things that seems to be uh, going back to what Ryan was saying earlier, a bit of a flat signifier. So I, I'm going to talk a bit more about that in a while, but wanted to give you a sense of what data we're trying to put in to uh, this database. Um, now this database is already following in a tradition uh, that several other institutions have already, it's generally been the institutions themselves who have been doing this or a local uh, college or university that's been working with the public library. Uh, this uh, upper left corner is the New York Society Library, which has been uh, active pretty much continuously since the 1780s. Uh, they're still running today. And they have the CERC records for the whole run of their history. And they have as uh, somewhere between a proof of concept and a way of uh, getting people excited about what might be possible with this, they have done a database of their first book, which covers 1789 to 1792, uh, which gives you a lot of founding fathers because the capital is in New York and you have people like George Washington and Alexander Hamilton cycling through. Um, down the, the lower right is What Middletown Read, uh, which uh, has gotten uh, a lot of press in the last couple of years. The New York Times did a piece on it, Slate did a big piece on it uh, that's run out of Ball State University, and they have a set of about a decade's worth of records in this from 1891 to about 190, uh, 1902. There is a gap in between that. They finally figured out the reason for the gap was that there was uh, an epidemic in town and just about anything from that particular period was burned so that it didn't spread contagion. So there, there's that fragility to the archive, which doesn't seem to have affected Easton's records, but you know, it, does, it helps to explain one of the reasons why these caches are so relatively rare. Um, and uh, particularly pre-Civil War collections are rare. Um, the Society Library allows you to look at books, it allows you to look at um, patrons, and it allows you to look at specific pages, so just scans of the book. You can get the same things in what Middletown read, but they've also done a lot more uh, bibliographic work. They've done, they had NEH funding to build up the bibliographic work as well as importing census data. And because it happens as late as it does relative to our project, uh, they're blessed with really great census data that gives profession uh, address. And so they're able to slice and dice the data in interesting ways. For instance, you can search by, uh, is this a blue collar, uh, lower white collar, or upper white collar reader? 
um, so that you don't just have the profession, but these kind of cl uh, classes, if you or, or categories of professions that you can work with. What we're looking to do incorporates this kind of thing and then takes a, a few steps further. So you can search for loans, you can get this kind of information uh, on loans. This is kind of a, a, a test record uh, that we've uh, put together. This is one of the wireframes of what the interface will look like once it's ready to go or close to what it will look like. Uh, you can look at what's going on with the book. So you can see, okay, this particular book is checked out four times. Who is the, the shareholder? Who is the, what we're calling the representative, the person in that other category? Um, but then you're also going to be able to do these kinds of books by subject versus patrons by occupation. You can start to run different analyses depending on what kind of search that you're doing. You can visualize it within this space. There's also a way to go to another space that allows for more extensive visualization. So you can do, again, very basic uh, network analyses here, uh, but then going out to the other space, you can start to get uh, much fancier where you can actually see some of the, the statistics behind uh, what's going on. Um, you can start to do this kind of bivariate and uh, multivariate analysis that allows you to start trending in all kinds of exciting ways. Um, these network analyses will eventually be animated, which helps you to get a sense of the strength of connections going back and forth between these. So that's all like a fairly near future. In the next six months, that should all be up and running. But we're still trying to get a lot of data into this. Um, and so because we uh, don't have everything together, uh, let me just give a, a very quick background of um, what's been going on that has slowed this down. This is, again, the realities of these kinds of projects. This was originally put together in uh, MySQL. Uh, it's been written in Cake uh, PHP at this point, and just about everything is now being migrated to Drupal. And uh, what's really going on that's uh, kind of a big thing in the, our digital uh, library department right now is that uh, they've done eight to ten different projects at this point. Each one's been built from the ground up, and they realize this is actually a ridiculous amount of stuff to maintain. Uh, so they've, they're building a shared repository uh, using Islandora. And uh, that should be done in the next month or two. Once that's done, it will be much easier for them to run the back end of a lot of these kinds of projects. Uh, so for some of you, that probably means next to nothing. For some of you, you may be very interested in that. I toss it up just in case that is something you're interested in. But maybe it gives also a sense of the collaboration that's involved, that you have to take these kinds of things into account even while you're trying to figure out who was George Washington art? Why is he checking out the life of George Washington or something along those lines? The one result that we have been able to get, and I just got this in the last week or so, uh, just asking the librarians, could you run a top 20 list for this presentation? What are the, the 20 most checked out items uh, for the years 1811 to 1825 that we've uh, run? And uh, I was pretty surprised at the first hit, Edmund Burke turns out to be the most popular read in this collection with 752 total loans. Uh, the portfolio, maybe less surprisingly uh, to specialists in this field, comes in second. This is one of the big magazines of the time. Um, then we get Goldsmith's works below that. So there's something about Irish authors that, that really seems to get Estonians going. Uh, then the Analectic magazine, select reviews of literature, American Museum. This is Matthew Carey's American Museum. So it's donated, uh, full, close to a full run of it is donated when the library opens. It's, um, it's been out of print for about a dozen years at the time the library opens, but this winds up being pretty hot. So the idea that people want to read periodicals because they're current doesn't necessarily explain what we're seeing here. Uh, but there is an interest in periodicals. Then we get Charles Roland's uh, Ancient History, Hume's History of England following very close behind. Number nine, we get our first work of fiction, Jane Porter's The Scottish Chiefs. Of course, you've all read Jane Porter's uh, The Scottish Chiefs. Um, this is, um, and so not too surprising, the uh, fiction collection at this point it accounts for about 10% of the volumes, the whole thing is about 720 volumes. There are just over 70 volumes of fiction at this point compared to in 1855, 40% uh, of the collection by number of volumes will be fiction. Uh, so fiction might not have as big a presence at this particular point. I'm going to come back to that in just a moment. Shakespeare does manage to squeak into the top 10 uh, with a 17 volume set of plays. Um, the volume numbers is something else I want to touch on in a moment. Um, 
New Monthly Magazine and Literary Journal, we got another magazine in there. Scott's Poetical Works, not his fiction, but his poetry, makes it onto the list. Bruce's Travels comes in next. Then we get Weems's Life of Washington, uh, of cherry tree fame. Uh, then our next work of fiction, if we don't count Weems's fiction, the next work of fiction <laughs> is uh, Anna Porter's Hungarian Brothers, different Porter, keeping with the theme. The Spectator shows up. Then we finally get American Fiction, which my students were relieved at when they uh, uh, heard the list, that Irving sketchbook does show up. And it actually shows that this guy is fairly big stuff because the sketchbook comes out in 1819. He's only got about five years to put a dent in this list that's been compiled for uh, almost 10 years before that book comes along. So it, it, it's doing pretty well. Don Quixote is just behind that. And uh, then we have uh, Silliman's Journals and uh, Thomas Smith's um, Wonders of Nature and Art rounding this out. So what I want to uh, kind of conclude with is to ask you, what are the next questions here? Uh, what do we need to ask to go beyond this point? What this is counting is every time a volume associated with the title is taken out. So big sets are going to get bigger play. Uh, one of the reasons why periodicals show up so much. So I'm interested in that. I'm also interested in how to think of this as not just literary history, not just social history, but also the history of reading. Um, can we think of reading as an aspirational act? Because these loan records will not tell us whether or not somebody's read something. It will tell us whether or not somebody's interested in reading or want to be seen as reading something. Um, so I'll uh, leave it with those questions as well as one last uh, issue. Uh, what um, does close reading have to do with this kind of project? Do we close read the loan records? Do we close read literary works to follow this up? Do we close read um, entire uh, lives within this? So say go through all of George Wolfe's records and try to extrapolate something from that. So I'm also interested where close reading fits into this. Thank you very much. Well, Gene sets up, I'll introduce us. Uh, I am uh, Jim Egan. I'm in the Department of English at Brown University. And uh, this is my colleague and collaborator, Jean Bauer, who is also at Brown University. She's a digital humanities librarian. Um, and uh, uh, I should, first of all, ooh, look, she's already got it set up. That was quick. <laughs> can, I just, uh, can I just say thank you all to uh, the sponsors and uh, for uh, those organizers for letting us um, uh, participate today. Uh, Jonathan, I don't know if you noticed, but I have the card here, a la David Letterman. This was, my, this was what I started many years ago, using cards for stuff uh, in the David Letterman tradition. Uh, just one more thing, and that is the structure. So what Gene and I are going to do today um, is uh, talk about the uh, mapping project that we're working on together. First of all, we're going to do a little demo, show you what, it, what the project is, what it looks like right now, and then we're going to uh, talk about, um, that's on the other side, we're going to talk about here's how we got there, and then we're going to raise some questions that we have about the, that the project is generated for us. Jean, you want to talk a little about the demo? Yeah. yeah. So um, this is the Mapping Colonial America's publishing project. Uh, the URL is rather long. Um, <laughs> it's up there. And uh, I can tweet it out afterward if, uh, if people can't get it in time. Um, but yeah, so this is basically a data visualization project uh, as it stands at the moment. We have our, the, the gallery being a series of ongoing experiments, of which at the moment there are three, um, and we are pulling data from two sources, the American Antiquarian Society, thank you, um, and uh, the two rare book libraries at Brown University, uh, the John Hay Library, which is currently under renovation and will hopefully be reopening in September. Uh, and then, of course, the John Carter Brown, uh, which is the, one of the largest collections of New World publishing um, anywhere. So what we are doing here is one half of the project, which is experiments, visual dives into library catalogs, basically seeing what's there, what can we do, and what can we learn about these really sort of fascinating and oddly hybrid, the oddly hybrid text of the library catalog um, using the, uh, and we're, we're doing this at the moment with the, the D3.js visualization library, which is a JavaScript library that lets you do uh, maps and all kinds of other stuff. And we're about to find out if this will load on your <laughs> network. 
There we go. Hey. Yeah. All right. There was a little suspense there. With yes. <laughs> so um, this is um, actually rather ostentatiously and probably inaccurately entitled Sites of New World Publishing. <laughs> it really should be Sites of New World Publishing at Brown. I currently live on the Brown campus. And uh, what we have here, though, is a map based off the library catalog data of everywhere that we think something was published that we have at Brown. Um, and you can do a couple fun things. So if you actually start to move your cursor over here, places will light up. And you will see how many we have in total. Um, and they will turn red. Uh, if they're smaller, they will turn very small reds. So we'll go down to the Caribbean where you can see it better. Um, and you can do that. Um, you can also search. So say, we know Philadelphia is here somewhere. <laughs> go There it is. It's large, it's red, it's behind <laughs> um, things. Because one of the things that we did, um, there is an animation to this. So if you say, if you want to zoom, we'll, we'll restart the animation. Pan up, restart the animation. Um, as it says on the site, this is not time-based. Uh, I mean, there, there's a time delay in the animation, but it's not related to chronological time. Basically, we wanted to draw the larger circles behind the smaller circles, so the smaller circles, basically so that uh, New York, Philadelphia, and Boston didn't just obliterate the entire East Coast up to Halifax. Um, and so you, have, so you have this, and now you can see other things. The other thing that you can do, which is kind of fun, is we have uh, Voronoi uh, polygons, which get much more interesting the closer in you get. So let's go into the, um, and we, we have these pan up, pan down buttons because a D3 um, can kind of, its little brain can get blown on too many click events. Mm -hmm. And so um, working with a, an undergrad programmer, I did some of the initial uh, visualization work and then we hired an undergrad, uh, Dan Schiebler, to finish off some stuff as my life got more complicated and our visualizations got more complicated. And, uh, and he quickly realized that he was going to have to do buttons um, because by the time he'd put in all these click events, D3, we, it would work like three times and then it would just start going. <laughs> so, um, so you have this, you can sort of go in and what, this, what these polygons mean, and this is actually also how we get the mouse event, mouse overs to work, is that inside this polygon, um, Every, all the area in this is closer to this dot than it is to any other dot. So basically you can see areas of publication and sort of zones of publication, and which is why the East Coast gets just completely grayed out when you do it on a large level. So we have this for the John, uh, for, um, for the John Carter Brown on the Hay. We also have one for the American Antiquarian Society, which is for see, North America. And then we have another one, which is the other side of what we were originally interested in. Um, this is also from American Antiquarian Society data, which is looking at genre. And we started out with library catalog genre, because why not? Um, and uh, it turns out that what you get is a really interesting statement on the history of cataloging. Um, what you don't necessarily get is an interesting statement about how people at the time thought about genre. So we're interested in questions of how to get at that issue, and I think our demo's over. So. Yeah, well, I just wanted to say how I got here, because I, I, I think, I don't think it's true, that I, was, I started this project, um, it grows out of incompetence and failure, really, on my part. Um, <coughs> failure in the sense that um, I was trying, when I would teach, one of the great things about teaching at Brown is that I get to teach courses in my field. I like Chris, I'm an early Americanist. Usually you don't get to teach many courses in your specific field when you're an early Americanist because a lot of people don't want to take those courses. Brown, I'm lucky to do that. But one of the things, one of the challenges that I found was trying to get them to see, to understand the world of print, in, or the worlds of print in 17th and 18th century colonial British America. They would come in, understandably, with presuppositions, assumptions about those worlds, and I would try to tell them about to try to inform them about how there were different kinds of print worlds than they were used to. And I did, I could do it, but I never got the sense that I did it well. So I went, I thought, well, you know, because I'm a visual learner, I thought maybe what I could do is I could put it on a map. I can put what I know, and I thought that I knew everything about the print worlds of 17th century and 18th century colonial America. 
so I could just pr put it put it in some kind of visual map. So if you go back to the let's say the JCB data, right? I had the idea that if I could just ha find a map and I could put it on that, uh, then I could make it work. But actually, I should go back one step because actually that wasn't my first thought. My first thought was going back to Ben's talk yesterday. I thought, you know, if I could find the graphs. I could, somebody must have graphed this out, where things were published, when they were published, over time. You could see this. This must have been had in the history of the book project. Somebody must have done this. So I looked for it, and, maybe, and I think that was part of my failure. Somebody must have done this at some point, but I just couldn't find it. And it was at that point that I said, well, okay, maybe I'll just draw it, because I knew. I knew what it looked like. I just had to draw it, except there's where the incompetence comes in, because I'm the worst drawer in the world. So mm. Ryan, yesterday you said that you can't spell on the board, mm. right? I can't draw on the board. So I couldn't do that. So then I thought, well, I'll just get the data, and I'll have somebody help me do it, thinking it was really easy. And that's when mm -hmm. I contacted the American Antiquarian Society for their library catalog data. And I actually thought there would be no way they would give it to me. Why would you give somebody that much data to use it for their own purposes? But the AAS, you guys were so nice. You guys were so generous. You gave it to me, and I thought, aha, problem solved. I've got this data. So I didn't know what to do with it, and I didn't even know how to open the kind of file that I got. <laughs> <laughs> so eventually, I tricked me. <laughs> so eventually, to my great, great um, joy, and the proof that there is a higher power looking out for early Americanists, Brown hired Gene, and then Gene. In talking with Gene, it became clear to me that this project was much. Uh, had much more potential than I really thought it was. Mm. And, and it was in talking to her that I was led to see that, one, um, uh, the data itself uh, needed to be parsed in certain ways. I mean, I could see myself just looking at the stuff that this category of genre was an <coughs> historical category. And that um, the, the, the catalog data was not going to reflect, as Jean said, what the people in the historical period, how they would have parsed that data in the first place, how they would have imagined uh, literary types in the first place. I knew that. But I was OK with that. And I'm still OK with that because it opens up all kinds of questions that I find really interesting to investigate and interrogate. But in talking to Jean, one of the many things that I've learned from Jean in the, in the collaboration is Jean had this great idea to say, well, you know, actually there are all kinds of books here at Brown for which we have a catalog. Maybe we could just go to the JCB and the Hay mm -hmm. and we could use their data and start there. And you know, Jim, by the way, you know, you might want to think about North American, not just colonial American printing, but or North American printing, but uh, the Americas printing. And one of the things that's been great about that is it's turned into not just a pedagogical project, but it's had all kinds of research implications. And when I show this data, when I post it on my Facebook, so it was with your Facebook friend of mine. I don't know if you've ever seen this on my Facebook page. You probably just, you've probably unfriended me already. <laughs> uh, when I post this there, every, the most of the comments are about, you know, I never thought of North American literature in this way in relation to South American literature. Even some of the, um, the uh, you know, hemispheric scholars will say, wow, I never imagined it that way. So uh, mm -hmm. that's how I got there. I don't know how you got here, Jean. Well, um, I showed up at an English department something, and then I got an email saying, hey, I want to make a map. Um, <laughs> and we sat down, and then, of course, it turns out my, I'm finishing a PhD in history in early American, uh, in early American history back at the University of Virginia. I'm a diplomatic historian, so I, I tend to think hemispherically and globally, because that's where all my people are. Um, and so the trick about this project is that you need, it's very difficult to read these kinds of, of catalog records and understand what you're looking at if you don't have some background in the period in question. So there are a lot of people at Brown who can make maps, and they make beautiful maps and fabulous maps, better maps than that. Um, but the idea of the historical changes in, in names and in structures in the New World before 1800 is the kind of thing that the, uh, the spatial structures and the social sciences group, S4, RGS group, just doesn't have. So you, you, you give them this stuff and they go, well, why is there, there, where's West Virginia? And you're like, well, there wasn't a West Virginia until 1861. Uh, it's just Virginia. Um, and, you know, and that's not, they have other domain specializations. So looking at this as an American historian, and looking at, uh, who also has a background in the history of the book, 
Um, you know, I learned a lot also about library catalog data coming into a library from a history background. I'd used library catalogs, you know, all of my professional and most of my recreational life, because I'm a book nerd. Um, but I'd never really tried to work with them as opposed to just use them. And one of the things as someone who comes from a database architecture background as well, is the realization that these things were designed to be retrieved very quickly and grouped and then read by a human. But they are not designed to be parsed in any algorithmic, systematic way, especially the rare book materials where the, the goal of the rare book cataloger is fidelity to the title page. Mm -hmm. And there really isn't any good um, agreement on how to handle geospatial information within a library catalog. Now, the American Antiquarian Society has a database where they've done this on their own, but uh, Brown University Library doesn't. And, uh, and most of our places of publication were Latinate. They were Latinized um, places because that was what was on, was on the title page. Yale wanted to say that it was printing from Novi Porti, Connecticut. <laughs> Not Newport, Connecticut, but New Haven in Latin where Haven is port. Um, so thinking through this, thinking through the information architecture of libraries and thinking about the library catalog record as this hybrid genre of highly fielded and often alphanumeric hashing, um, and then extremely freeform text that can actually get quite long, mm -hmm. that live maybe not with each other, but near each other structurally and group and come together on the understanding that you would find the book by its title, by its author, by the year, maybe, maybe not, <laughs> um, and then you'd read the thing. Um, and then coming at it from a computational algorithmic perspective and going, you know, computers, they suck at language. They just, they don't know what to do. So this is sort of the information modeling side of it that I've gotten really interested in. And um, there's been so many great projects here on library catalog data that I think maybe we could have a great conversation. Um, we are building a slider by the way. Right. Oh, yeah. Um, Can I just interrupt you yeah, for a second to you say? you do that and I'll pull up the slider. I, the thing that I forgot to tell you about the origin was that what I wanted to do, when I originally imagined it as a map, after I gave up looking for charts and graphs, when I originally imagined it as a map, I had the most grand ideas possible. I didn't want it to be a static map. I wanted it to be a map where you would have, um, where you would be able to tell uh, how many poems, how many sermons, how many whatever, however you would classify the genres, were printed in each location. <coughs> I wanted you to be able to have the map move, uh, map animated so over time you could see the changes in publication in the various places. I wanted them to be able to relate to one another so you could compare places to one another. Um, and so I wanted it to be not a static map, but an animated map that would go over time. And that, to some extent, that is still our goal. Mm -hmm. um, but it's taken longer to achieve than I had thought. Which is fine because in the attempting to achieve it, I have um, uh, become absolutely obsessed now, I think that's the only word to describe, with, uh, generic, with, the problem of classific with the problems of classification in the first place and with problems of uh, uh, particularly classifying how, his, a historical classifying of the 17th and 18th century. How those would have been, how literary types would have been understood if they would have been understood at all in those periods. And to do that, of course, it's not possible to limit yourself to North and South America. So you have to go outside that. Mm -hmm. um, three, I've also been fascinated now by a textual object that I had never thought of as a textual object, which, as Jean was pointing out, right, library categories are, catalogs are textual objects. And I had never <coughs> thought about them in that way before. Um, so those are, mm -hmm. so that's some of the questions that I've come out with while Jean mm -hmm. looks at, shows us now the slider that we're trying right. to do. So the, we have a slider working, and we're just in the process of making the, um, the data work with it. Um, but what it will do when it's fully done and it has the data behind it is it will, you can either just pick any one year or you can pick a range of years and you can slide either just across through all the years or you can slide across a range. So say you want to take a five year block. Um, all the places will come up and eventually the goal is to have actually the titles 
of the books that appear in that range also show up and you can click on the title it'll take you back into the Brown Library catalog um, so that then oh we're done we're way over oh, okay uh, that's it okay talk to Locke then I'll okay. say one more thing yeah. and that is uh, a we're still in a fairly early stage of the project B we want but the, uh, they're just like with uh, Ryan, yours, and Elizabeth's project, this is going to generate more stuff than we could possibly do on our own. <laughs> and so we want to make this as open to people as possible. A, in terms of ideas, we want to hear what you guys think, what suggestions you have, what ideas you have. But also, con collaborators and contributors are welcome. You know, yes. we, we see this as an ongoing project, not just of ourselves, but of other people as well. So as much help as we can get, as much input as we can get, as much collaboration as we can get, that's great. Yes. And everything is on GitHub, and it's under a non-commercial variant of, of the MIT license. So, including right. the underlying data. There's the bow. <laughs> I have given my eyes in service of my research. Mm -hmm. One way to uh, do research is actually is to marry the Antiquarian Society. That's mm -hmm. a clicker. I'm the only guy that ever had a fellowship there and married a member of the staff. <laughs> <laughs> That's so far. That's so far. Paul, I think it's going to go in that direction here. Yes. Uh, already married, but... Uh, <laughs> I'm the only guy. <laughs> right. That married a female fellow. Mm -hmm. Female mm -hmm. staff member. He's, he's a male staff member who has married a female fellow. <clears throat> anyway. Uh, 1993. I stumbled into the Antiquarian Society based on recommendations of uh, the late Bill Gilmore, who uh, was developing a very complicated project on uh, reading in Vermont, which some of you may have read, Reading Becomes a Necessity of Life. And uh, a lot of ways I was trying to do some of the things that he was doing in, in that project. When uh, another book came out that I felt obliged to read Ross Reamer's Men of Capital, which is a <coughs> Philadelphia book trade in the era immediately after the revolution. <coughs> Oops. As I said, I can't see anything. Let me get this Where's the cursor? The cursor's not working. Okay. Is there a mouse right here? Yeah. The clicker should Don't be. Don't worry about that. It should be plugged in now. Now. Let me get you going here. So there it is. Thank you. <clears throat> and it uh, became very clear very quickly that sort of a yin and yang thing was going on here. This is that Roz Reamer was talking about the one end of uh, the context of reading and printing in Virginia that I was interested in. Uh, the big thing, just, oh, I'm sorry I was late, but a couple, a couple of things I picked up on here is, is that uh, one of the things I think a lot of people that aren't dealing with early American literature really don't pay attention to enough of is the concept of a colonial economy. <clears throat> the only thing that you produce for yourself is that which you cannot trade your staple crops for. That's, and that's really the history of Virginia printing. If you can get it anywhere else, you don't make it. It's as simple as that. But <clears throat> I also discovered in the course of doing research on a book that's going to be out hopefully in the next year called Devils Among the Planters, Printers of Mary Prince in Jefferson's Virginia, is that letting printing loose in Virginia is literally letting the printer, uh, the devil loose in Virginia. My capacity as a printer's devil, I can get in anywhere. I can do anything. I can undermine the entire status quo. And that's really what happens when printing arrives in Virginia. It's consciously kept out of Virginia for 100 years. Is it's seen by somebody who is very close to Charles I as being a destabilizing part of society. Therefore, I ain't going to allow it into Virginia. Governor William Barclay. <clears throat> when it does come in, it comes in under very tight controls. But those controls loosen actually rather rapidly because the printer is allowed to do 
things that are not in support of the government, principally a newspaper and contract publishing. So over time, suddenly the governor loses control of the situation and it all comes to a, a boil in the 1760s. <clears throat> the devil in all of this is in the details. A lot of the references about Virginia in the Revolution in their era basically say the Williamsburg printing office was in the pocket of the governor and Thomas Jefferson and his friends brought in uh, <coughs> the Rhines, William and Clementina Rhine, to run an alternative press. Nonsense. The press was already out of control. What happens is two different factions in the House of Burgesses take control of the press. They lose, they first, the Northern Neck faction around Richard Henry Lee gains control of it until <coughs> new governor comes in, regains control of it. The guy that is in charge of the, print, uh, the printing office at that time dies, it falls into the hands of Alexander Purdy, who everybody assumes is in the governor's pocket. He's not, he's in the pocket of the Tidewater elite. The Northern Neck crowd around Richard Henry Lee brings in the Rhines, and Governor Fauquier has nobody to print for him at all. <clears throat> the devil is in the details. Very interested in the context of all of this going on. It doesn't fit the old-fashioned uh, narrative. So I start looking into the source material to see if I can figure out what the context is. And what do I discover? Hundred-year-old sources. Right? How long has it been since Evans published the last volume? Right? It's even worse in Virginia. When did Swem print his last volume on, on Virginia printing? And the problem with Swem is that he only uh, published on public prints, things paid for by the government. Period. Nothing else. So, gee, what do I do now? Well, then I moved to the Antiquarian Society. I married the Antiquarian Society. And someone very nicely on her free time copied the 300 or so entries in the printer file that had connections to Virginia. And I started trying to figure out connections because what I could see both in Evans and in the printer file and in other standard sources was that <coughs> there's an awful lot of errors there's an awful lot of omissions. So for the last 20 years, I've been trying to fix that. Problem is, <clears throat> there's a lot of material out there. And until recent times, it's been very hard to get at. So what I was doing, where did my clip go? I lost it. Let's see if I can get this. But the, uh, I sat down and made a form where I transcribed all of the data that's on the printing file cards at the Antiquarian Society. Realized this is 20 years ago, okay? And then, over the last 20 years, I've just simply added to these sheets anything that I have found along the way to describe each one of these people. As a result, uh, it's gotten very uh, complicated because in the last eight to ten years, suddenly there's digitized materials out there that you can draw on. This is literally thanks to Redex, which is probably the largest single contributor to this entire project. The digitization of newspapers that uh, Antiquarian Society has gone into with <coughs> America's historic newspapers. This is literally one of those, one article. But now you can pull up <clears throat> I can pull up everything I've taken notes on for 20 years and every image that I've been able to capture off the web concerning that person, they're in a folder on my computer. Okay, now what do I do with this? How do I make this now accessible? And the idea is to go back to where I think I got most of this material from. Let's get it up on the web somehow. The more and more that you look out there, there are lots of different cataloging sources. There are lots of different online databases and digital images that you can pull up. This 
all these manners are just simply a sample of what I've drawn on. These are the, uh, the most frequently used. Uh, there is a problem in all this, though. I like to call it the ancestry problem. Ancestry.com. If the name matches, it has to be the person. Right? And this is one thing you find constantly, even in the American Antiquarian Society prayer file. <coughs> Worst example I thought of that was a guy they attributed to running a newspaper in Fredericksburg when he was eight years old. Because he had the same name of another guy. So, so what do we do with this? <coughs> I have had, as a result of all this research, uh, the ability to write three different kinds of stories. Uh, biographical entries, which are created at this point for 465 different people that were part of the Virginia printing trade between 1730 and 1820. In the process of writing that, that starts with the 300 that I have in the Aquarian Society. I added another 200, filtered out 35, added 80 more. There's still 80 more people that I have to go deal with here. The other fun thing that Susan, my wife, and I debate all the time, I found 80 counterfeiters. Do I include them in the database? Yes. <laughs> yes. It's a yes, but two thirds of them are Smith Silversmiths. So the question is because the principal means of, of currency in colonial America is coins, not paper. So how do you read this, right? I've been able to discern 118 specific newspaper lineages, essentially a you know, a, a genealogy of each newspaper, 118 different titles published before 1820, and the kicker, more than 4,000 titles produced by Virginia printers before 1820. Most of these are in standard reference sources, but somewhere around a third of them are not. There are things that have been picked up by simply looking at online catalogs. <coughs> so well, how am I going to make this all work? Well, <coughs> each one of the histories that I've written in each one of those three categories, uh, the whole form has been, the history, the sheet, has been written as an XML document that has data fields built into it. That the data fields can then be searched and extracted. Actually, what we're in the process of doing at the moment is taking out uh, all of the data fields and putting them into a search table <coughs> that is going to link across each one of these different things. So if you know the name of an individual and you go into the database, you're going to be able to find every single person he worked with, every single imprint he had his hand in, every single newspaper he was associated with every single location in Virginia where he was. But they don't stay in Virginia. <coughs> this is essentially the schematic of how the search process is going to work. You put in a search request, it goes through all, looks in all three of the databases, it brings you back a set of linked results, you choose from those linked results, it goes back and pulls out the documents that you want to look at, essentially in each one of the three different categories. Here's all the biographies, here's all the newspapers, here's all the, the imprints. <coughs> this is what the individual biographies are going to look like. It's a PDF image document in the, uh, when you get it called up. As I said, it was created as an XML document. We decided we wanted to protect the text inside of these things. We don't want people just hijacking this. Right? putting it up as their own work. So we're going to make it a little difficult for them to copy. But if you know what you're doing, you can do it. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> but the idea being, you're looking at a page in a book. It's just coming from an electronic source. And the people in control of the database, starting with me, we control the content because we understand the materials that went into each one of these biographies. There's a certain level of expertise that, uh, and uh, 
competence, for lack of a better word, that goes into each one of these. The data fields are at the top here. This is one of my more favorite characters. He's a bill collector in Richmond who publishes the first city directory in Richmond, but he is also a very dour Quaker who's very, very tall and very well known in town. But you'll be able to search all those data fields and then pull up this biography. The biography itself will also have genealogical data that's been able to be discerned from all sorts of different places. And then at the very bottom, a list of the sources that went into this biography. So you can look at this just like you do any book. Footnote at the bottom. And if you see something wrong, feed it back to us. Our concept, my concept for this is that this is a collaborative project. I'm the gatekeeper, but I'm not the authority. I'm convinced, even though I've spent 20 years trying to fix all the mistakes that I've found, there are tons of mistakes in this. There's no way around that. Right? Basically because a lot of the source materials can be very wrong. Bibliographic records look like the same thing, except you also tend to have a very large annotated note in many of these. This is about Benjamin Banneker's last almanac, which all variations of it were apparently printed in Richmond. <clears throat> Again, the data fields, the sources, newspaper histories. You can see here this lineage of uh, the original Republican newspaper in Fredericksburg goes through four permutations. <clears throat> the data fields that can be searched, the source material that's at the bottom of the form. It's going to go into a, a searchable website. This is the uh, mock-up that I provided to my friends in Charlottesville. Who do. I'm not so good at the uh, back end of this stuff that I'm going to try to attempt that taken me, as I said, 20 years to do what I've done. But in doing this, I got invited to be part of something else, the People of the Founding Era Project, because this is another project. This is uh, <clears throat> hosted by University of Virginia Press, something called Documents Compass, that they're doing their digital projects. My uh, index is going to be part of the Digital Initiatives Program at the Virginia Foundation for the Humanities. But as you can see from the bottom of this, essentially it's the same outfit. They're in the same building up on the hill next to my cello. This uh, is a project where they've been going through all the published papers of the Founding Fathers and pulling out any footnote that has biographical material and then creating a database that you can search looking for all of these uh, <coughs> individuals, right? Which we should. Come on. Here we go. There we go. Oops. Search field here. Let's just look. As I said, I give my eyesight in this, in this project. I can't see in the dark anymore. And you'll find that they've got 129 printers listed in this database. One of the things I find most interesting, though, is I looked at this. What should I show you guys when I show you this last night? Did I spell that right? No, I didn't. Left an A out. This is all they have on Isaiah. <laughs> the founder of the American Antiquarian Society is that part of my future here is to take what I've been doing with the index of Virginia printing and upgrade these kind of records so that they look something like what I, I have already in this index. The first phase of this is the biographies. It went down to Charlottesville in July. 
It should be up sometime in the spring. The original very first phase of this. Then the next phase will be the imprint uh, themselves, which I'm about two thirds of the way through at the moment. And then the newspaper history. So two years from now, it'll be fully complete. The idea is that this now becomes a source for projects like the Browns do. Is that this is what is being produced in Virginia. It's not, uh, it's in so many different library catalogs that it's nice now that you have them all combined in one space. You can build all sorts of, of geographic models, uh, linking models, and one of the things that uh, it's eventually going to have the same thing as the founding era project is that it's going to have the, those circles of connection as part of it as well but if you wonder i know paul does what the hell i've been doing for the last 20 years in Western, <laughs> this is it thank you Building on forms of online databases, um, so they're all um, they're all uh, projects that I think um, originate in this notion that the digital is going to solve problems, right? That, that as Jim said, let's just make a map, right? Let's let, let's just build this thing that will. Um, and if, and if if the, if we could sum up the whole panel in a few words, it would be um, it's not as easy as we thought it was going to be. <laughs> and the um, so I want to just make two points about that. It's not as easy as we thought it was going to be. Um, and that I see emerging out of these, um, uh, these exciting um, uh, projects. One is that, the, um, that the, the sort of fantasy of aggregation or the fantasy of the digital archive um, and of the kind of distant reading that it, w that it might entail actually leads to intense forms of close reading, right? And to the problem of what I would call um, entification, right? And entification, what I mean by that is what is an entity, right? So what is an, like in each case, the question of what is an entity suddenly, you know, drilling down uh, it becomes an issue. So what is a place, right? Mm -hmm. um, what, is a, what is an archive? Whose archive is it? Um, what, is a, what is a record? What is a book? What is a printer, right? In, in every case, the trying to, to aggregate means that you have to um, define the entity that you're aggregating in the first place. And it turns out that that's not so easy, right? That that raises all, these, all of these questions. Um, and what I, what, I, what I would say about that is that that's exactly why we need humanity scholars doing this work because this is one of the things that we're good at is is um, asking about where the boundaries of um, a text, a thing, an idea, an entity is. So um, this is why um, uh, it's not just counting that's going to um, make this work matter, but reading and the reading at the very close level that all of you are grappling with right now, as well as at the at, in the distant ways that um, that the promise of having so much information available um, uh, makes evident. So, so the first point would be that distant reading leads to close reading. Um, and the second point is that um, trying to structure the archive or trying to put together an archive um, means, means one is immediately knee deep in the politics of um, that archive and the politics of knowledge production, particularly um, when we turn to a space like early America um, which is a, a world that is structured by colonialism. Um, uh, Chauvin's project is so fascinating, that question of whose archive are we talking about, and I think we can talk about that question not only in terms of um, uh, who has kept that archive, but also for your purposes, who's going to use that archive? Who do you want to be using that archive? Um, uh, and, and those are um, important and engaging questions. And then I think with each project we could say, well, what are the politics that inform both um, what we have access to historically um, and how we're currently structuring our understanding of those materials. So the politics are, are operating both historically and in the present as well. And that said, I'd like to open it up for comments. I just have a, uh, one uh, term I want to open up to entification mm -hmm. and is implicit in Jean and Jim's uh, presentation, which is that of genre. <laughs> um, 
Uh, and because sometimes the catalog, and this is part of your wonderful comment about the history of cataloging, sometimes they're printer genres, or I think it was printer genres or historian genres, and sometimes they're literary genres that because you're in early America, you're dealing with the shift to the recognition of, of a set of cat and emergent set of categories that we now recognize. We've got text with those long titles in which nowhere in the title is marked the genre that we now understand it to be. So we need a kind of um, multiple uh, generic frameworks and also historical frameworks so that something that we now understand as autobiography, uh, which was a genre that didn't exist, can, uh, I mean, if it's going to be useful to, I mean, in our fantasy world, mm -hmm. to literary critics, right, there's, there's a really interesting um, stall that you get to um, with that word genre when we assume that we know what it is. It's actually the most generic definition of genre that we tend to use, i.e. it's just a, it's a type. Mm -hmm. um, but what kind of a type? I mean, are you, are you addressing that in some way? It's just particularly vexing. And well, yeah, I mean, uh, or Molly, do you want to just well, come in first? I just, and wanted, then? I just, just sort of feedback on that, because I, I, I really love the way you guys are thinking about that as, as well, and the ways in which these projects in so, so many ways reflect the history of libraries in the 20th century. Um, uh, you know, as well as as something that happened mm -hmm. earlier, um, and and it just struck me that another place, you know, Jim, as you're getting interested in this question, is uh, that the, I know the American Library Society, the catalogers deal with a lot, is children's literature. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. That that's a place for genre and and and, and you know, where these questions just because we look at something that we might recognize as almost like a slave narrative that gets cataloged as children's literature. You know what I mean? That it's just like this huge, do you know what I mean? They so don't have the child until the 19th century right. as we understand it. Right, right, so, right, yeah. right, right. So anyhow, I just, just to say that like that's another place where these kind of... Yeah. Well, to look back into the history of that a little further, the ELC has three main catalogs. The, the 1855 is printed, but there's a manuscript one in 1816, 1832. The 1816 one, uh, it's only, here are the octavos that we have, here are the quartos that we have, and here are the duodecimos that we have, numbered. 1832, it starts splitting into genres. 1855, it split into more genres. And those are the subject headings we've used. We, we're keying from the 1855 catalog, but it is interesting to see how some of these things will jump from one to the other. And there's this huge miscellaneous category in the 1832 where a lot of those things will now have kind of buckets that they go in in 1855, but the miscellaneous category is still there, and it's a little bit surprising what winds up in that category sometimes. A lot of Irving, for instance, winds up in that category. And so just to quickly piggyback off that, um, one of the things that we're thinking about, um, one of the things that we're hoping that, uh, so J Jim and I work on this project very much together, but there are parts that you know something only I can do and only he can do. And so one of the things that we're probably I'm going to probably move forward on while he's working on thinking about what to him would constitute figuring out the genre question is actually moving forward on the format question. Right. Right. Um, and what size of book and what type of book were published on, on a physical level in different places because that is very well represented in our catalog. Mm -hmm. And it gets into lots of interesting <coughs> questions of distribution networks of particularly paper, mm -hmm. of who can print mm -hmm. octavos and who has who can print folios and who can print things. Um, so that's one thing that we're moving forward on. To pick up on um, Elizabeth's earlier point, as a as a database architect, I think of a lot of those questions of what is an entity is coming under a larger topic of, of data modeling, mm -hmm. generally speaking. And this is where I think the digital humanities, where the real intellectual work of digital humanities occurs. Mm -hmm. A lot of the programming, even I mean in this, it's pretty basic stuff. I mean it it it, it, it it's got a design eye behind it, but D three is not you know, we're we're not we're not pushing the bound I mean Ryan's pushing the boundaries of computer science. I am not pushing the boundaries <laughs> of computer science. I'm really writing code. Um, but it's the data model and it's thinking creatively and in an informed way about what it is that you're modeling. So that you aren't just saying, well, I have a thing that makes widgets. I think the thing that takes widgets and puts out widgets and so I'll just take all my things and make them widgets and then I'll get widgets. Yeah. You know, but <laughs> creating a system that will handle the sources in a way that is appropriate to the questions and appropriate to the material is where I think a lot of the intellectual work of digital humanities lives. Yeah, and I just want to piggyback on what you're saying, Gene, to get back to your question there. Uh, yeah. You know, I, I had not, I think you articulated well what it is that <coughs> I want to do. I mean, that is actually where I find my interest going in this disjunction. For On the one hand, you do have this catalog material, which is a historical record mm -hmm. of that period. On the other hand, you have these 
behind that catalog material are these texts. And, the, and in those texts are some, I think, some form of classification. Mm -hmm. um, uh, how one understands that classification in relation to the category that I have, to some extent, arbitrarily chosen of genre, mm -hmm. um, which is a modern category, mm -hmm. uh, at best, um, how those two intersect is exactly my interest. Mm -hmm. and, and I guess what I think is, to me, it doesn't differ, or to me, it overlaps with the problem of I'm in an, a literature department teaching works that A, would, a the category of literature itself is a historical and 19th century product. B, the, most of the people that I write or that I teach in the 17th century and that I write about would never have considered themselves American. They would have been, to them, they would have thought, wow, that's ridiculous, I'm not American. So those problems, I, that's one of the things I've discovered through this project is, wait, I have to do that at the level of form, too. Yeah. 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 So following up on the genre question, I mean, not only is genre sort of ever-changing and emergent and more modern than the period you're dealing with, but the notion that genre is going to be a one-to-one -one mapping of test yeah. category. Right. Exactly. And I wonder if there's... No, we many to one. Is, is there a way many to make to your system... <laughs> Is there a way to make the system embrace those complicated mm -hmm. Not only the multiple cate mm -hmm. categorical possibilities, but mm -hmm. also the way that it changes over time. I mean, can you have yeah. a field that what a person in 1801 would have understood this to mm -hmm. be, what the cataloger in 1955 understood it to be, mm -hmm. what you mm -hmm. as researchers understand it to be? Is there a way yeah. to mm -hmm. we'll add that layer? Yeah, I mean, there, there isn't a database behind, there isn't a relational database behind this at the moment. Right now, if mm -hmm. you can go to the GitHub account, you can see all the data files that we're using, you can take them. Mm -hmm. um, just don't, you can't sell them. You can do whatever you want, you just can't sell them. <laughs> or can't give them to someone who will sell them. Um, Is there a market? It's under a, it's under a non-commercial variant of the MIT license. So legally speaking, yeah. illegally you can obviously do whatever you want. Um, but what we have are, are <coughs> JavaScript documentation data structures that are pulled directly out of the catalog with certain filters on them, and we're just shoving those at D3. Um, I mean, I always am happy to build relational databases. It's what I do if I'm left alone. Um, and so, but it's very easy to, it's very easy to do something like that. So what you would have is you would have a work, a table, a table of works, you would have a table of genres, and then you would have a linking table where you would say this work, this genre, this year, this, and then any other additional, and there's notes field, right? Everything has a notes field. Um, that people can then later complain about. Well, why was that in the notes field when it should have been fielded? Yeah. At least it's there. So you know you can do. There's there's a very yeah. simple yeah. data model that will allow you to do that. It's you just have to then Jim has to come up with. All Brian, of Brian, and then Brian. Yeah. <laughs> well, I just wanted to say that I mean this is basically what we've been doing with the Fresh project, which is to say when we're categorizing clusters by genre, yeah. one cluster can belong to multiple genres. Yeah. Um, based on lots of different factors, just as one newspaper can belong to multiple affiliations. Uh, they can be both abolitionist and republican, and, you know, because we had to think really broadly about that. I think one of the interesting challenges that, with the history of cataloging part, though, and maybe Brown's done a better job than my institution, all the books in my institution uh, were accessioned in 2005, when they moved into the next library system, the next ILS. So if you're actually looking at when those genres were placed on those works, uh, we have you actually uh, have those dates to get at. Mm -hmm. I mean, one way to do yeah, it Brown does that, yeah. Do you, I mean, have you played around with using Dewey versus LFC mm -hmm. subject designations as a way of trying to think about that connection? Um, we will now. Thank you. <laughs> there's, there's, a, there's a problem with that, though, because OCLC is stripping everything out of everything. WorldCat is dumbing everything down. That's why we are using, that's that's why we yeah. went back to the Brown catalog, actually. I mean, we, now that we've met all you lovely people, we're going to be hounding you more. Brown's one of the good, um, one of the good places. Yeah. But to, but the places like UVA. Okay, yeah. last, last question from Jonathan. Um, I just wanted to engage with uh, Siobhan's project a little bit and point out that um, one of the reasons why I love thinking about um, indigenous archives, indigenous heritage, because it provides a strong critique of simple open access. Mm, yeah, um, yes. You know, a lot of the right. rhetoric around this is we're going to create it, we're going to give it right. away. Right. Um, and it's a, it's a wonderful example for students and information in schools and things to say, wait, slow down. 
Um, and it's also, I think, a problem that's related to getting federal funding for such projects. Uh, Colonialism re inheres itself yeah, in yeah, yeah, yeah. the way that you have to make things publicly accessible um, for certain mm -hmm. projects, uh, which is something that I've been thinking about because my department has a tribal libraries, archives, and museums program, TLAM, um, that does a convening culture keepers project in the upper Midwest. Mm -hmm. um, that's been really interesting to get students engaged, but uh, it's some of the similar issues that you're dealing with. Um, but I would also like to say that unlike um, perhaps the NEH, ODH, which is a great organization, I'm happy that it's there, um, the Institute for Museum and Library mm -hmm. Services, I think, the IMLS, um, does fund things that are more about human relational projects than they are about That's building tools. That's a good tools. thought. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. the, uh, the IMLS, is, yeah. it seems to me to be a little more interested in what can be funded to transact between and among people rather than what can be built and made free. Mm -hmm. um, the NHPRC as well, the National Historic Records okay. Preservation, although they'll, they'll, they're federal, so they're, they'll have a similar mm -hmm. open policy. Mm -hmm. But I do think people need to keep saying out loud that like colonialism is also in the yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like an institution that, 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 I, that I like that we defend and love. Thank yeah. you, because I recently referred to it as a colonial institution and somebody freaked out. <laughs> <laughs> so that was so yeah, long ago. You know, how, how do you how do you defend and, and critique the same? Right, 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 right. right. Thank you all. Thank Fabulous you. panel.